G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we react to round nine of the AFL season. I've listened to the people, I've taken your feedback and I got rid of my massively long intro, so there you go. That being said, I can't be bothered editing a new one, so we might just go without an intro for a few weeks. Now, the first thing I want to talk about with round nine was the absolute belter of a Friday night game we got. Off the top of my head, that was probably the best Thursday or Friday night game this season. Honestly, I thought Melbourne played really well and were probably the better side out of the two for at least three quarters. To some extent, they exposed the Eagles similarly to how Essendon did last year in Perth by using the ball really quickly through the corridor. Unlike the Essendon game, the Eagles were up to the challenge somewhat and were able to stay within a few goals by three quarter time. What Melbourne really lacked was polish and they really had their chances to ice the game in that third term. Instead, they left the door open and to be fair, the Eagles were brilliant in the last quarter. I think they might have gained a little bit of confidence from Melbourne missing so many opportunities and they started winning the contested ball and their ball movement in general looked a lot less stagnant. And I have to say that Liam Ryan mark was one of the best moments I've ever witnessed in an Eagles home and away game. The most amazing thing about it was it was actually he who passed it to Kennedy in the first place. I might be in the minority here when I say that I actually don't think Melbourne's season is over just yet. They're looking more and more like their old self and if their fitness can improve, I reckon they're still a top eight smoky. In the next fortnight, they've got the Giants at the G and the Crows at TIO. And if they win both of those, they'll go five and six. If they drop one of them, they're probably toast, but I could see them winning both. Anyway, my other favorite game of the round was the Lions and the Crows doing battle at the Gabba. This game was widely tipped by a lot of people to be a thriller, but I must say I disagreed and I thought Adelaide were gonna win by about four goals. The Lions led by as much as 26 points in the last quarter before the Crows slammed home the last four goals to make it a one point game. Lockie Neal for me did enough to get the three Brownlow votes. He had 39 possessions and 22 of them were contested. Probably the most significant thing to take away from that result is that the Lions sit in the top four and are six and three. With the fixture they have in the back end of the season, I'm thinking they're a top eight lock and possibly even a home final chance. Their next five include Carlton, St Kilda, Fremantle, Hawthorne and Melbourne. You'd expect three, maybe even four wins out of that. That would put them on a seriously good wicket for the halfway point of the season. Now, as much as it pains me to praise Richmond, I can't really praise them enough for what they've been able to achieve this season. Despite major injuries to important players, they currently sit six and three and are probably the fourth best side in it at the moment. During 2017 and 18, there was a lot of conjecture over the fact that was their success down majorly to having such a good injury run. Obviously, this is partly true because you do need some injury luck, but they're proving their doubt is wrong a lot this year. They've had massive injuries, but their second layer has really able to stand up and they've had young guys come in and contribute as well. Other than this week, they haven't even really been getting a whole heap out of Dustin Martin. You should always be wary of a team that's winning games despite missing players. We saw what happened with the Eagles last year and we could be seeing it again with Richmond. Other than Rance and Grigg, they should get all their players back at some point this year and if they can bank enough wins up until that point, they're going to be a serious contender. Absolutely no doubt. Now on Sunday, we saw the Giants absolutely tear apart a vulnerable Carlton side and, and while there isn't a whole heap of substance to come out of the game, I have to acknowledge Lockie Whitfield's absurd performance. He had 40 possessions, 18 marks, 3 goals and scored 190 fantasy points. As an opposition coach, you'd have to to say he's probably the absolute last bloke you want getting the ball 40 times. He's changed his role a lot this year and he seems to be playing high half forward and I think they're really maximizing the damage that he can inflict on the opposition. In a year where there aren't as many beltings as previous years, the Giants actually got a very valuable percentage boost as well. Next week is a huge test for them because they come up against a struggling demon side who will be playing for their season and it's at the MCG where the Giants are historically not very good. For them it's a bit of a must win because they need to prove they can win there, otherwise they're not a real contender. Now before we move on with the video, there is two roasts this round that I would like to give. Now there are many wonderful things about AFL that make it one of the better sports in the world, but one thing that has always comparatively sucked is our commentating. I've long held the view that commentators like to pick a team at the start of the game that they want to barrack for, and then you don't really hear about the other side until the end of the game. <laughs> or they'll just get noticeably glum when the opposite team kicks a goal. This happens far too much for mine, and I'm talking every single week it's noticeable. The latest example for me was Cameron Ling commentating the Collingwood St Kilda game on ABC grandstand on Saturday. Now I just turned on the radio and I was aware that St Kilda had closed within five of Collingwood. In fact, I think they led at certain points during the game as well. And then Cameron Ling just went on this rant about how good Collingwood were to step up to the challenge that the Saints were giving them. And then you didn't hear about St Kilda until the end when he's like, yeah, the Saints have a lot of work to do. Yes, to some extent it is true. Collingwood did well to respond to a team that was playing well, but to not give the Saints any praise in that moment seems like total bullshit. Anyway, it's just a minor example, but it happens all the time. My second roast is for West Coast Nathan Vardy. Of, there's been a lot of discussion about Vardy's reaction to Max Gorn being used as a step ladder for Liam Ryan. Ryan takes the hanger on Gorn and Gorn is clearly dazed from the contact. Vardy then proceeds to go to Gorn on the ground and grab him and give him a bit of stick for it, which I realize sounds sexual. 
but I'm sure you know what I mean. But this action from Vardy really pissed me off because Gorn absolutely destroyed he and Vicky all night. Nathan, congrats on your seven hit out and five disposal performance. Now go and sit the fuck down. Now for our footy tipping competition results. We had four tippers get a perfect nine this round. However, no one did better than King Nelson who scored nine and had a margin of eight points. So he is our weekly winner. However, the latter leader remains Dave Ganjo and he sits on top with 55 correct tips. But it is very tight with only margin separating he and Farmer once a five. I had a shocking round. I thought it'd be a good idea to change my tip to Hawthorne over Richmond at the last minute and paid the price. And our fantasy league leader is still Killer Prad. He's yeah. averaging 21.77 a game, which is just crazy. That's really impressive. But he's only 12 points ahead of the next bloke, Chad Booth. Now, normally in my True Footy Reacts video, I take you through the votes of our True Footy Player of the Year award. Unfortunately, Lewis is being a slut and hasn't sent me his votes yet. But if you want to keep up with that leaderboard, you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram, preferably both. And I'll be posting the results of that later this week. As for our running Mock Brownlow Award, we do have a three-way tie at the top. We've got Lockie Neal and Travis Boak, who are now equal with Tim Kelly on 13 votes. Both Neal and Boak got three votes from me this week, while Adam Trelaw got one vote for his 38 possession game, and he is putting in a really consistent season. Anyway, guys, that's all we have time for this week. It's a little bit of a shorter one because I'm hoping to get out a third video this week, so stay tuned for that. In addition to my round 10 tips, I'll be giving you my power rankings for the first nine rounds of the season so far. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing, like the video if you liked it, and I will see you next time, guys, somewhere on YouTube. Thanks.